Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Welcome to the Washington Institute. Thank you very much for coming today. Um, this is a very special uh, event for us. Uh, uh, issues surrounding uh, the U.S.-Israel relationship and its role in overall U.S. Middle East policy have been a central focus of the work the Washington Institute has done for many years. And so therefore we are very pleased to be able to, uh, to be the publisher of this new study by my, uh, my colleagues up here on the podium, um, Ambassador Robert Blackwell and uh, Under Secretary Walter Slocum. Um, uh, they have uh, 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 a very important presentation to make, so I'm going to be quite brief in what I say. Um, uh, let me first say that uh, 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 this is their final study. Uh, as In accordance with our normal procedure, um, we are going to be passing this out as you leave our conference room so that you spend your time over the next, uh, um, you know, over our luncheon listening to our speakers rather than flipping through their, uh, their product. Or but attacking as you, the weak point. <laughs> or attacking the weak point. So as you, as you leave um, out in the front, you can, pick up, uh, you can pick up our final product, which is Israel a strategic asset for the United States. Um, our two speakers, uh, Ambassador um, Blackwell, um, has a, uh, a long career in the American diplomatic service and as a uh, veteran foreign policy practitioner. He served most recently in the Bush administration um, as uh, special assistant to the president and deputy national uh, security advisor for strategic planning, as a presidential envoy to Iraq, as America's ambassador to India. Um, his, uh, his service goes back um, uh, several decades. Um, much earlier in his career, uh, Bob Blackwell uh, served in Israel uh, as political counselor at our American embassy. He was the um, uh, American arms negotiator for the conventional um, forces uh, negotiations with the, with the Soviets. Um, a broad and distinguished career. And uh, I'm delighted that he participated in today's, um, uh, in the project that we're releasing today. Um, Walter B. Slocum, um, uh, whose service um, goes back even further than uh, Bob Blackwell's, uh, has uh, served um, uh, uh, in the Pentagon um, in uh, high policy positions in both the Carter and the Clinton administrations. Uh, he served in the latter as Undersecretary of Defense for Policy throughout the Clinton administration. Um, uh, uh, in the Bush administration, he was a uh, um, uh, very important uh, official in our, um, uh, in our effort in Iraq as well. Um, I'm, uh, I'm very pleased to have both gentlemen participate in this, uh, in this project. And uh, with that, I'm going to turn over to them to explain uh, um, the who's, what's, why's, and what the conclusions of this project is all about. Ambassador Blackwell. Thank you, Chairman. Good to be here. Um, Walter and I, uh, as we uh, thought about the U.S.-Israeli relationship, of course, uh, began with uh, the proposition that that bilateral relationship is based uh, on two unique uh, pillars. One uh, unique in the Middle East. One, um, the sharing of democratic values between the United States and Israel. And second, uh, America's moral uh, obligation to protect the Jewish state. 
And those are both, of course, quite uh, familiar uh, foundations for the U.S.-Israel relationship. But as we thought about it, uh, we decided to uh, launch ourselves, the two of us, an inquiry into the connection between Israel and the U.S.-Israel relationship and America's national interests and to look at the U.S.-Israeli relationship through the optic of American national interests. Uh, as we did that, uh, we came to the view, which we will describe to you today and then have a talk, a discussion about it, that Israel is a strategic asset of the United States. And uh, our presentation is going to be in three parts. Uh, I'm almost finished with the first, which is a conceptual proposition that um, the uh, benefits that the United States uh, accrues from its relationship with Israel with respect to American national interests should be, if I can put it like this, the third pillar of uh, the U.S.-Israel relationship, uh, a canonical part of that relationship which uh, is not, has not been usually uh, mentioned in the past. So that's our conceptual proposition that we're advancing here today. Walt is then next, uh, as I finish here, going to uh, describe specifically the benefits that uh, the United States uh, uh, gets from its relationship with Israel connected to our national interests. And then when he's done that, I'm going to conclude by addressing the question of a net assessment and especially whether the United States pays a price in the Arab world for its relationship with uh, Israel. So with that brief introduction, uh, Walt will now uh, do as I suggested and talk about the, uh, the benefits specifically we get from the relationship. Walter. <clears throat> Thanks, Bob. I, I want to start out by thanking the Washington Institute for giving me this opportunity, not least because it's been a special pleasure to work with both Bob and Rob on it. Um, as Bob says, what I want to talk about is some of the specific direct benefits that the United States security interests get as a result of the relationship with Israel. And I think what it shows is that although there is a sort of caricature of that relationship as a strictly one-sided, the United States spends a lot of money, expends a lot of political and diplomatic, even military capital on protecting Israel and gets nothing in return, I think that's a, a gross distortion. And our analysis shows, I think, that the U.S. relationship with Israel provides us with significant direct benefits, and I want to run through a number of the specifics. One is in the military-to-military -military relationship. It is the case now, which was not the case at various times in the past, that there is a very close and cooperative relationship between the U.S. military and the IDF. The joint exercises, joint training opportunities, exercises that will be one uh, at a quite substantial level, Marine Corps exercise coming up next year, will be the biggest uh, in U.S.-Israeli history. And there have also been exchanges on military doctrine. Uh, both the United States and Israel have, unfortunately, a fair amount of experience in counterterrorism and uh, urban warfare operations, and the United States military has benefited from the opportunity to have exchanges and discussions of these issues at a quite practical level with IDF officers. Another is access to Israeli military technology. Uh, there are a number of areas in which Israel is one of the world's leaders, if not the world leader, in, in specific areas of technology. 
the most probably well known is uh, UAVs, unmanned aerial vehicles, where Israel is not the only country that, that is interested in them, but certainly Israel has taken the lead over a series of years, and that technology and that experience has been important for the American military. A specific area that I think is much less well known is armored vehicle protection. Uh, some Israeli technology has been incorporated into the urgent, some would say belated, effort by the American military to develop technologies that would make American uh, military vehicles of various kinds much less susceptible to IEDs and mines. And the incorporation of Israeli technology into some of these efforts has literally saved American lives in, in Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, this area of taking it, this field of taking advantage of experience that Israel has had also applies in, in some homeland security areas. The one that I mostly because of my personal views on this issue and most interested in is TSA trying to learn from the those of us who've been to Israel understand the difference between a serious effort to maintain, uh, to keep control of who gets on airplanes and a theatrical effort to maintain control of who gets on airplanes. And there is some indication that uh, DHS is interested in a little more reality and a little less theater, and the Israelis have a lot to teach us on that front. Missile defense is a particularly important area of cooperation. It's not an exaggeration to say that Israel is the only country other than the United States that has ever made a serious effort, uh, the Soviet Union aside, has ever made a serious effort to develop a ballistic missile defense system. And there's very close cooperation between the United States and Israel. The United States has put a lot of money into the Israeli efforts, but we've gotten important benefits as a result. Some of these are technological, but at least one very important one is operational. That is, there is, as I'm sure most of you know, an operational Tippy 2 X-band radar now deployed in Israel that makes an important contribution to this whole concept of using the Aegis-based systems as the, as the basis for a defense of our allies and friends in, the, in Europe, but also in the, in the region generally. <clears throat> Israel also has made available to the United States, and the United States has paid a part of the price for, uh, the, their development of defenses against short-range rockets and missiles. But the issue is not entirely one of technology. There are certain areas in which Israel has very important niche capabilities that the United States has made, has made direct purchases of hardware. Well, those include some short-range UAVs, targeting pods, helmet-mounted sites, armor for uh, uh, mine-resistant ve vehicles, and there are other opportunities. Now, much of this is joint development, but it means that the United States gets access to something which, in a, in a way, is more than price. It is experience and technology and practical knowledge of how to make these things work and work properly. And that's an important advantage. Probably the area where the cooperation is biggest and closest and least well known, and in spite of our distinguished records in public service, the ones where it's hardest to get the details is intelligence. Uh, but, I, but the people we've talked to made clear that the United States-Israel relationship in the intelligence world is, for the United States, almost the closest in the world, and arguably the British is closer. But the relationship with Israel is, although not without tensions, to put it mildly in the intelligence world, is a very close one. Uh, Israel, we share a lot of information and assessments that the Israelis share with us. Uh, Israel has some unite, unique advantages in terms of collection, access, linguistic, and other skills, and also, I think, to some degree, a willingness to do things that we would be reluctant to do. So we get a lot of, of information. But there are also instances where active measures by intelligence agencies on the part of Israel <clears throat> have been very helpful to the United States intelligence effort. I suppose the most dramatic example of this is the information on the Syrian reactor and on nor North Korean support for it. There are areas where cooperation is starting, but will 
are very much expected because there's a positive attitude on both sides that we will get access to Israeli experience and expertise in two particular areas. One is cyber defense and cyber warfare generally, and the other is what the jargon calls national resilience. That is the effort in the homeland defense area, not simply to prevent terrorist attacks, which is obviously a great thing if you can do it, but be able to roll with the punch and absorb the blow so that the terrorists are denied their most important objective, which is not so much the immediate damage as the after effects, the chaos, confusion, lack of uh, cohesion in the society. Um, there are also instances in which Israel has undertaken military operations <coughs> that objectively, as our Soviet friends would have said, advance U.S. interests that for one reason or another the United States <coughs> has not undertaken and is even perhaps unwilling to undertake. Some of this is pretty concrete, like acquisition of foreign military material, examples of hardware that the Israelis are able to obtain that they give us access to. But there are also actual operations. If, as many people believe, and I think is not strenuously denied, it was the Israelis who attacked the Syrian reactor, that's another example. And more importantly, in terms of the broader U.S. Uh, position in the, in the region, the fact that Israel and the IDF have such powerful military capabilities itself contributes to deterrence of actions that might be taken by other hostile countries who have to worry not only about American reaction, but about Israeli reaction. And that is an important benefit uh, to, to deterrence. <clears throat> there are also instances in which Israel has refrained from actions that from the Israeli point of view were probably in their interest, but they were prepared to not do it in the name of broader American interests. The one that I was directly involved with uh, had to do with the Israelis' decision to repudiate their contract with the Chinese to build the Falcon airborne early warning system. Now, of course, this cooperation, what the Israelis make available to us, serves Israeli interests as well in almost all cases. And it's also true, and I think an important part of the context, that U.S. support for Israel and Israel's security serves U.S. interests. And that would be true even if Israel didn't do anything at all for the United States. There are reasons both of values and, strategi and strategy why it is a good thing for American security that we stand by Israel. But I think it is important to bear in mind that there are real benefits. We are not arguing that Israel is somehow more important to the United States than the United States is to Israel, but that this is far from a one-way street, and that it is important to add this element to the discussion of the relationship between the United States and Israel so that it is not seen as strictly a, a kind of unearned benefit that the United States confers on Israel. Thanks. Um, thank you, Walter. Um, it might be said, um, at least uh, by some, that notwithstanding these benefits that uh, the United States uh, acquires through its relationship uh, with Israel, which promote U.S. national interests, that nevertheless, uh, Israel is not a strategic asset of the United States because of the reaction in the Arab world to uh, the U.S.-Israel relationship, uh, that the United States pays a substantial price in the Arab world for the U.S.-Israel relationship. Uh, we don't think that's true. And we began this exercise that I'm now about to describe with an open mind to try to uh, analyze and, uh, and uh, enumerate the ways in which the United States has paid a price in the Arab world for its relationship uh, with Israel. Now, we all know that uh, the U.S.-Israeli relationship is hardly popular in the Arab world. And we all know that, uh, that polling shows that most Arabs, not all, but most Arabs condemn 
uh, the intimacy of this relationship. But the criterion that we used in trying to analyze uh, this issue was not how do Arabs in general feel about this relationship, but what do Arab governments do with respect to this relationship? And the conclusion that we have come to is that uh, we weren't able to identify uh, uh, in the period after the 1973 oil embargo instances in which the United States paid a price with Arab governments for its uh, relationship with Israel. Or to put it differently, American diplomats and uh, uh, policy makers sitting with Arab colleagues, of course, here uh, yesterday, today, and probably tomorrow, uh, much condemnation of the U.S.-Israel uh, relationship. But when Arab governments act, at least our analysis suggests, they act on the basis of their national interests. And uh, we can't find, but we're eager to hear what you all think, uh, we can't find uh, examples uh, of uh, tangible, concrete actions that uh, Arab governments uh, have taken, uh, which have exacted a price on the United States for its policies toward Israel. Or to put it differently, if I might, would Saudi Arabia's policies toward the United States be markedly different in practice if Washington entered into a sustained crisis with Israel over the Palestine issue during which the bilateral relationship between the United States and Israel went into steep systemic decline. In that instance, would Riyadh lower the price of oil? Would it stop hedging its regional bets concerning U.S. attempts to coerce Iran into freezing its nuclear weapons program? Would it regard U.S. policy toward Afghanistan any less critically? Would it view American democracy promotion in the Middle East more favorably? Would it be more inclined to reform its internal governmental processes to be more in line with U.S. preferences? Walt and I judge the answer to all these questions as no. Now, uh, I understand that this is a controversial proposition, and if you read, as we've been doing in the course of this project, the pundits, the literature on this subject, there is what I might al almost call uh, dogma to uh, refer to uh, theoretical thoughts in the Middle Ages and the Catholic Church that the United States pays a big price for its relationship with Israel in the Arab world. And uh, it is, uh, as you know, uh, frequently argued that this is the case. But as far as we've been able to find, it's argued without any basis in fact. It is, uh, like Catholic dogma in the Middle Ages, an assertion which is beyond an evidentiary base and uh, therefore, uh, at least to us, not persuasive. Uh, let me conclude uh, our presentation, and then we look forward to our, our discussion, uh, with some operational thoughts about the way forward uh, in the U.S.-Israel relationship on the basis of uh, our study. First of all, uh, that uh, the United States, political leaders in the White House and around the administration and in the Congress, should expand uh, the national discussion on Middle East issues uh, to include a place, uh, an explicit place, for the role of U.S.-Israel uh, relations as a strategic asset of the United States. 
and not be hesitant to say that. Not be hesitant to say that. Uh, being a Kissingerian, I would, uh, uh, remembering Henry, say, it has the virtue of being true. <laughs> Second, that the United States, as we go forward, should seek to maximize the advantages that we derive uh, from Israel and that the list that uh, Walt uh, uh, gave earlier should be expanded. And then finally, uh, that the U.S. security strategy policy communities should, uh, in an entrepreneurial fashion, policy entrepreneurial fashion, more seriously engage on the strategic aspects of the relationship. Taken together, these measures, these operational uh, prescriptions would ensure that U.S.-Israeli relations are seen as not only a vehicle to express deep-seated American values and fulfill America's moral responsibility, but would also serve as an explicit and uh, crucial means to advance U.S. national interests. Our hope is that as we go forward that this third pillar will become a routine part of the way that our politicians and public and all of us talk about the U.S.-Israel relationship. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Bob, Walt, I appreciate your, your comments and your presentation. Um, let me open the floor directly to, to your uh, questions and comments for, for these gentlemen. Uh, first, Dan, if you could use your microphone, uh, press the button in front, uh, and identify yourself uh, for, uh, for posterity. That's a lot of things to do. <laughs> I'm Dan Raviv with CBS News. Thank you very much for ad addressing us today. Um, on the question of dogma, one can't know how things could be better if we added some more facets to our policy, whether thinking about uh, our national security in the future or specifically about the Middle East. For instance, you didn't mention the Arab Spring, but you mentioned Arab governments. And so you said by your analysis, the current Arab governments, using Saudi Arabia as a prime example, wouldn't do anything different in key areas. But what about the people there? Maybe the power of the people is rising. Maybe there will be changes there. Maybe the U.S. would be seen better if we added clearly to our support for Israel also a lot of support for Arab democracy, perhaps for Palestinian aspirations, etc. cetera. Uh, now, how did that fit into your study, please? Um, I think it's a good question. Uh, oh, it's can, a can you do this from the mic? Oh. So they can see you. Oh. I'm not sure that's an advantage for the, uh, <laughs> for the audience, uh, which was saying, let him sit, let him sit. Um, I think that's a good question. Uh, it's a prospective question, right? It, it is. Um, but the first distinction I make is between what the mass, Arab mass, thinks and what governments do. That's the criterion. And uh, you suggest that uh, Arab governments, because of the Arab revolt, phrase I prefer to uh, a uh, one that adverts to the seasons, um, because as you know, there is no spring in Egypt, not to put too fine a point on it. Um, but anyway, um, and metaphorically, it also may have some problems. But anyway, back to the point. Um, uh, it may be in Egypt, we may see uh, a growing influence of mass opinion on Egyptian foreign policy, which would affect uh, the United States. Not yet. Okay, so it's a theory, could happen. Uh, I think that uh, it's highly unlikely to happen in the Gulf for a variety of reasons, which I think are self-evident. Uh, but my guess is on Egypt, my guess is that uh, partly because of the Egyptian military, maybe even largely because of the Egyptian military, that the rhetoric may change, will change, has been changing perhaps since uh, the revolt began, 
but that the policies are not likely to change very much. But it's a good reminder to, uh, to uh, keep a watching brief to see if, in fact, that happens. But I think it, in terms of American national interest, the laboratory is confined to Egypt. The laboratory is confined to Egypt and doesn't, I think, affect any other country that would have a substantial effect on our national interests. Uh, yes, Hillel. In the back. <clears throat> Thanks, Rob. Uh, Hillel Fratkin of the Hudson Institute. Um, my question, it's actually two. One regarding the past. Um, you spoke of how uh, traditionally the relationship was conceived of, uh, but uh, we have spoken for many years of a strategic relationship between the United States and Israel. And I was wondering how that third pillar, uh, what place, if any, it had uh, in that prior conception. Um, and secondly, uh, you made a recommendation at the very end uh, regarding uh, the engagement of the policy community, I guess, for want of a better term, here in Washington and elsewhere, about um, acting on your findings and developing them. I, I was wondering what you thought would be the the appropriate ways or way or ways to do that. That would be very helpful to know. Thank you. In, in terms of the strate the development of the strategic relationship, well. Let me at least try to answer on the first one, the first part. Um, as I think I said, I believe that one, and I think our, our work it supports this conclusion, that the United States gets a strategic benefit from the very fact of its support for Israel. Not that there aren't problems and that sort of thing. Part of this is a result of the United States not only defends its not only defends its its re realpolitik interests, we defend our principles. But this is a case where we defend both, and I think that's true of a good many of our other security relationships. Um, and in that sense, I think this, there's been a long-standing sense that the U.S.-Israel relationship is a strategic one and not simply a values one. There's also this specific point, which I think is quite important, of the contribution that Israeli capabilities make to keeping the lid on in the region, at least in terms of large-scale military operations. And that is very much in our interest, that we don't have to do that alone, that we have help from the Israelis. I, but I think the thing which we've tried to add in this study is that it is not a one-way street, that there are ways in which Israel does things which are in some sense independent of the U.S.-Israel relationship, which help us in fields other than the direct issue of, of uh, Israel. So I think it, it's those, those three elements that seem to me to be the elements of the strategic relationship. As to what about you, Bob, you can take the rest. I agree with all that. I'll be a little bit more irreverent. Um, I think if we uh, had an hour and a Harvard graduate student, we'd find that the United States has strategic relationships with about 70 countries, maybe higher. And then you ask, what's the content of it? And what was striking to Walt and I as we went through this project is, when we began was, well, we can find some place, undoubtedly, that has the sort of list that Walt went over. We couldn't. We couldn't. And so we, um, we uh, accumulated it um, from a variety of sources, essentially one at a time. And I think that's uh, noteworthy uh, because uh, despite the term, um, much of the policy community hasn't thought of Israel as a strategic asset of the United States. And to demonstrate that fact, try and find an administration that has said that, rather than we have a strategic partnership, which, as I say, we have that with 
uh, dozens and dozens of countries. Um, and often it has very little content in it. Uh, the last thing I'd say is just again reinforcing something uh, Wall said, which is as we go forward, what we're really saying, you can, if you insist, you can go on using the word strategic partnership if you'd like. It's not one I favor, but if you'd like, uh, it's free country. We'd like to give more content, that's what those recommendations are at the end, uh, to uh, the substance of that strategic relationship. We'd like, uh, as we talk about it, uh, a greater recognition of the way Israel, in the specific ways that, that Walt mentioned, serves our national interest. I do want to say here, and it's an important, maybe a paramount point, that in making this argument, we're not in any way seeking to diminish the power of the first two pillars which are absolutely fundamental and uh, transcending the democratic values and moral responsibility. But we think the third pillar should be included. On marketing, your ideas are welcome. Uh, David Makovsky, up in front. Can you use the mic, please, David? Uh, the, um, I was going to but the Dan Raviv question, um, which seems that since 9-11, and maybe this administration as well, there's been more of an effort of trying to create political distance between Muslim communities and radical communities. And therefore, it's not just about regimes, but about peoples, too, since 9-11. And maybe this president also sees himself as a historic bridge in that regard that he doesn't just think ter in terms of regime. So I don't know if you had any thoughts on this trend since 9-11. The other element is more maybe not as much asset liability as the issue of alignment, that a lot of I Israel and America's enemies are, are tend to, to overlap. I mean, that just as a lot of uh, America is very concerned about Iranian encroachment in the Middle East, certainly so is Israel, Al-Qaeda, Hamas, Hezbollah, <laughs> Uh, and a, a lot of these Arab states know that if the U.S. would also walk away from this relationship that has been reaffirmed more than any other commitment, they could walk away from any commitment the United States has made. And frankly, you're happy to see maybe Israel do some of their dirty work in confronting their own enemies. And so this isn't, I don't know, as an asset liability, but as, as, as that, that, that America's friends, Arab friends in the Middle East and Israel, have have a kind of a, a similar strategic outlook in terms of who are destabilizing forces. Gentlemen, come in. I think that's in the category of the Harvard question, which then says, "Don't you agree?" <laughs> uh, uh, yes, as you know, those of you who've been at Harvard seminars, that's the question. Uh, don't you agree? Um, uh, let me say though, but because I don't entirely agree, um, uh, that uh, I think there's a lot to it, but I just say this, that um, what we sought to do, and when you get a chance to read the report, uh, is not get inside the heads of Arab leaders. Um, because um, I'm sure they have a variety of views and so forth. Our criterion was the actions that governments take not what they tell our diplomats. And now we've had an opportunity to see how, through WikiLeaks, how American ambassadors and diplomats report in the Middle East and have for decades. And what they say is, the uh, not every one of them, but the general theme is the U.S.-Israeli relationship bears serious costs for the United States and the region. So that's what they say. We haven't been able to identify any of them, and neither do they, actually, in these uh, memoirs and telegrams. Uh, about uh, the issue of uh, peoples, again, it's very, I spent on and off my career at RAND when I wasn't in government or doing other things. Um, it's extremely difficult to get any good data on recruitment for Al-Qaeda 
and uh, the role of the U.S.-Israeli relationship and the Palestinian issue and so forth. Uh, uh, Walt and I both were uh, served in, in, in Iraq, so I'm most familiar with that, and that is not part of the narrative of Al-Qaeda Iraq. We also know that at least in the early days after 9-11, the Palestinian issue and the U.S.-Israeli issue did not figure largely in Osama bin Laden's public statements and al-Qaeda's. But it's very difficult to get at the actual data. And so when my Saudi friends say, which they do, well, you know, the U.S.-Israeli relationship and the Palestinian issue is the single best uh, incentive for young Saudis to join terrorist organizations. I have no way to evaluate that. I'm not sure how much data they have, but I don't think that American policy uh, should be uh, affected by such a nebulous question. Or to put it differently, let's imagine we had that sustained uh, crisis uh, with Israel that I described earlier. Do you really think that substantially fewer young Arabs would join the terrorist uh, network if they were so inclined and say, well, I was going to join it, but I guess I won't now. I'm really quite doubtful. Yes, please. I'm Natasha Mosgovay from Haaretz newspaper. I was just curious to, to ask you about yesterday's vote at uh, UNESCO um, when uh, 107 countries basically vote against the U.S. position, do not consider it as a part of this price that uh, the strategic relationship uh, with Israel uh, takes. No. <laughs> okay. my, my, answer, my answer is only slightly more complicated. <laughs> There's no dispute that a lot of countries, including not by, me, by no means all Arab countries, disagree with the United States and Israel about the Palestinian issue. And we're not claiming that that's not a real difference and it produces different votes in the United Nations. Uh, that's not, in a sense, that's not the point. Of course, those differences exist and that they will be reflected in the actions of, of different countries. But that's not the whole of the relationship and the argument is not that because the United States supports Israel and the Arabs, to put it mildly, mostly, and there would be lots of qualifications to exactly what you mean by this, the Arabs don't. They do different things about, about views on the peace process, views on settlements, views on embargoes, and, and so on. Uh, that's a, that, I think, is hard to dispute. The issue is that it is very, very hard and in our view, virtually impossible to find instances in which the Arab countries have done things other than about the Arab-Israel dispute itself that have hurt U.S. interests and that they would do differently if it weren't for U.S. support for Israel. Let me just add, uh, and I was, of course, uh, frivolous in my monosyllabic response. So let me just say uh, a few more words uh, because I think it gives me the opportunity to say again, the optic that we looked through was U.S. national interests. And so do I think that that vote, which was as you described it, had a substantial effect on U.S. national interests? No, I don't. Uh, Doug Fife, can you use the mic, please, Doug? <laughs> Doug Fife of the Hudson Institute. Uh, Bob and Walt, your argument is a flat contradiction of, and it seems in, uh, perhaps uh, even an answer to the Mearsheimer Walt thesis in their in their work on the Israel lobby, which was premised on the idea that 
the United States has no national interest in support of uh, it, it, no national interest that justifies you the kind of U.S. support for Israel that we've given uh, in over the decades. Well, I mean, how, you know how. What I guess what I'd like you to comment on is how could they have reached the conclusion that they did in light of the conclusion that you've reached? There is there is so much error in the world. Um, yeah, I mean, I think we have looked at what we see as the evidence. And I mean, I think they and there are others, people who know a lot about the region. I mean, I don't know about Paul Mearsheimer, but there are people who know a lot about the region who make the argument that at best, this is a pure one way street, an act of goodwill and charity that the United States confers on Israel. And I think our analysis shows that there are two fundamentally wrong things about that. One is the things I was saying, which there are in fact things the Israelis do for us. That doesn't mean Israel is more important to the United States than the United States is to Israel, but that there are, it is in reasonable proportion a two-way street. The second, and I suppose in some ways a more fundamental answer, is that the United States has good national interest, security, strategic reasons, whatever adjective you want to use, for standing by a country like Israel. And I like to make the point, it's not the only small country that is exposed to potential enemies that we stand by, and, and certainly whatever the exact balance is, our support for Taiwan or South Korea or during the Cold War, Berlin, during the at the time of 1991, Kuwait was pretty much something which was you know, they made very little contribution to their own own defense, and yet it was very much in our national interest. We do not have alliances as acts of charity, when that we have them because they support our interests, which in, to some degree include our. It's not that it's to some degree it includes our values. It includes our values, but it also includes other more concrete interests, and that's true of Israel. You I mean you'll have to ask the people who make the contrary <coughs> argument. I think it would be interesting to ask them whether they make the same contrary argument about the other countries to whom we also provide something like this kind of support. There are obviously there are differences, but the, but the principle is the same. Also, and you know far better than I, that ain't the only bad part of the Walt, of the Walt Mearsheimer analysis. Um, I just add uh, that in the many discussions that Walt and I had in preparing the report and in the innumerable emails going back and forth as we uh, worked on the text, never once was that book mentioned. The report is not a response to that book. Hopefully the report will have, uh, hopefully, a much longer lifespan uh, than that particular book, or indeed anything that uh, 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 is written uh, uh, in a contemporary way, because the argument we're trying to make here uh, is a very long-term argument, and it's not uh, subject to what folks write today or tomorrow. We want the debate to be on the long-term proposition, not uh, what happened last week or last month, or and it has really nothing whatsoever to do with the Israeli lobby uh, or friends of Israel or whatever you want to call them. Nothing whatsoever. We we never discuss that. Uh, Ray Tanter. On uh, Ray Tanter, uh, as a fellow here and at Georgetown University, uh, before. Bef I'd like to raise a question about the bureaucratic politics of implementing this idea because when Doug Fyth and I were on the NSC staff together in the 80s, we had a problem with state and defense with respect to how to implement this notion. And we worked on memorandum of strategic cooperation and we were fought by 
state and the uniformed military, not by the undersecretary's office that much, not by uh, the, the civilian side as much. So let's say that I buy, and I think several people in this room might buy the argument, and it does have the virtue of being true. How about implementing this in terms of the bureaucratic politics of getting state especially in line, but along with that, the uniformed military? Obviously, that's an important practical question. I can only speak really for the military. It would be interesting to know what uh, other people who worked in the Pentagon like Doug think. My sense is, and as I, as I think I mentioned, my sense is that the military to military relationship with Israel is much closer, much better, much more open than it was in the more distant past. Um, I think it, it is certainly true that many American military officers who also get subjected to the criticisms of the United States relationship with Israel make the point, which I think is hard to dispute, that if the United States, uh, if the Israeli issue weren't there, I mean, forget exactly how it ended, if the Israeli issue weren't there, there wouldn't be this, this criticism and this rhetoric, and, you know, it'd be nice. Uh, but I think the, the thing which has changed in the last 30 years is from a situation in which the United States military and the, and the had a very, very much an arm's length suspicious mm -hmm. relationship. There are a couple of things that the Israelis have done that have helped a lot with that. One is closing down the arms sales to China, uh, and it's never totally perfect with anybody, closing down bases for allegations, whether well-founded or not, of technology leakage. Uh, and I think those have had a, a salutary effect. Um, and I, I mean, I guess part of the answer is insofar as there are practical things that can be done by the United States, by leadership, by instruction, or by Israel that, that make it possible to do more of this sort of thing, it ought to be done. As to changing the views of the State Department, I have no suggestions. <laughs> You're not which, touch which, that I'm one. sorry, I don't mean to be I don't mean to be I don't mean to be that flip. I, I I don't have a sense first of all I don't honestly have a sense that the State Department is, is in some kind of a massive opposition to a good relationship with Israel in, in any sense of the word. And I don't know that there are quite the, uh, I'm sorry, I don't know that there are quite the, the concrete issues like the technology leakage and so on in this state. Now, Paul Berger, am I right? Paul Berger, Department of My questions are kind of related. Is that kind of related? To two previous questions. Uh, one, uh, in your opinion, does the current do the current policymakers of the United States share your conclusions uh, concerning the strategic asset? And two, why does it appear that the policymakers in academia seem so distant in their own thinking from your conclusions? Um, the answer to your first question is, I don't know. I don't know, and they may have different views. What I do know is that, at least so far, administrations haven't been willing explicitly and in public to make this part of the argument for the U.S.-Israel relationship. Now, whether the reasons for that, I'm not a psychiatrist, so I'm not going to uh, get into that, but any, they haven't yet done it. I hope they will. Uh, just a brief uh, uh, reference to the earlier question um, about the State Department and the government. I think it is clear that whatever resistance exists in the State Department, if it does, and it probably does to some degree to this proposition, the only way that's going to change is with the Secretary of State. It's the only way. Uh, I, if, if you'll permit an aside, uh, Doug and I worked, Doug Fyth and I worked on the U.S.-India relationship and saw how enormously difficult it was 
to change the embedded views of the bureaucracy across the government about how to think about India. And that's now been going on for a decade, and it still hasn't accomplished uh, its uh, transcending objective. So, and it would not have happened without the president in particular on the U.S.-India relationship. So the president has a big role to play in this regard, what the president says and what he demands of his government in this regard. It, whenever one tries to, ch at least my own experience uh, as a washed up Jedi Knight here, uh, uh, my own experience is that the kind of changes that are proposed in this report uh, never are bottom up, never because the bureaucracy likes to do today what it did yesterday, and it wants to do tomorrow what it did today. And by the way, there are some strengths to that. If you go into a uh, emergency ward at the hospital, that's exactly how you want them to think, right? Not, well, oh, look at him, he's bloody, what are we gonna do, all right? So uh, these have to be top, top down uh, uh, for sure, uh, and, um, we hope that uh, as time passes and, and we and others make this argument that that, in fact, will happen. Great. Uh, uh, do you want to address uh, the academic side of the question? No, I don't really. I'm, uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, I'm Pavlos Anastasiadis, Ambassador of Cyprus to the United States. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for uh, your uh, clarifying uh, a pre-existing conception. Um, may I ask you about the effect of regional developments and relationships that are developing or changing in the region and how those uh, might affect the value of Israel as a strategic asset for the United States and for uh, promoting the U.S. interests what I'm, uh, in the area. What I'm thinking about is the uh, positive changes in the relationship between Israel and um, uh, neighbors of Israel, which are not Muslim and are the only democracies in the region, and particularly my own country. And uh, we've seen recently uh, warming up of an already close relationship that extends in a number of areas, uh, of course, uh, the delimitation of the exclusive economic zones between Cyprus and Israel, uh, their cooperation in the exploration and development of uh, 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 what everybody thinks are very rich deposits of natural gas there, but also relationships in many other areas. Um, do you feel that these uh, type of developments um, safeguard or even further enhance uh, the value of Israel as a strategic asset uh, for the United States? And by the same token, whether other changes that we see in regional relationships might undermine that, and uh, as uh, both Cyprus and Israel face threats emanating from the same source recently. Thank you. Chris, I think that's such a thoughtful question uh, that it's certainly going to be more thoughtful than my answer, uh, without any doubt. But I'll, over time, uh, try to reflect on it. Um, I guess here's what I would say about it. Uh, first of all, praise be about the bilateral relationship between Cyprus and Israel, uh, as you describe it. Uh, but we looked at the narrow, as I keep saying, the narrow question of U.S. national interests. Um, perhaps later we could discuss this. I'm not sure that that closer relationship um, is it's good in and of itself. Presumably, the Israelis value it, I'm, I'm, but we didn't look at what the Israelis value. That's not part of this exercise. So I'm not sure whether uh, it uh, furthers our national interest. It's good in and of itself, but I'm not sure it does. Um, but while, while we're talking about uh, that part of the Mediterranean, uh, I think uh, the Turkey... Israel relationship is inter is interesting to think about in this context um, because I've I've seen some commentators say that uh, the United States is paying a price with Turkey for its relationship uh, with Israel 
And of course, we know that uh, Israel-Turkey relations are going through a difficult period. I think that would have been a more uh, persuasive argument in the absence of the collaboration between the United States and Turkey with respect to Syria, which is extremely close, as you know. So that's another one of those issues, which is when we look at, when we have looked at, Walt and I, the issue of what price is paid, we couldn't find one. So, and as for the way we started in your initial question, I think that's a terrific question. Let me, I'll think some more about it. And thank you for asking it, because I think conceptually it's important, not just your relationship with Israel. Uh, Steve Rosen. Just wanted to remind that uh, this this question of what price uh, the there would be for a uh, expanded U.S. strategic relationship with Israel was right at the center of what Ray Tanter was talking about, President Ronald Reagan's decision to launch the U.S. Israel strategic relationship. That was the pivotal moment, and his Secretary of State uh, George Shultz said the price would be limited, and his Secretary of Defense said the price would be very high. As a matter of fact, Caspar Weinberger argued that we would gain one ally and we would lose 25 from the Atlantic Ocean to the Indian Ocean. And if you included the Muslims, maybe to the Pacific Ocean. Uh, years later, when the uh, president decided against Weinberger and in favor of Schultz and the relationship was launched and the sky didn't fall, a friend spoke to Weinberger about it and asked him in retrospect, why was the price so low? Or did you were you surprised? And he admitted that he was surprised, and he said, I guess they thought we were in cahoots with Israel all along anyhow, so it didn't make that much difference. Uh, I, I believe that's close to a direct quote. Uh, and, and, and this has really not stopped. Uh, I think that inside the armed forces, in, in my experience, and in the bureaucracies of both the State Department and the Defense Department, this 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 uh, uh, business of estimating the cost goes on to this day. Uh, so I think your study is a real contribution. Don't you agree? Don't you agree? <laughs> <laughs> I'll I'll assume there's there's agreement. Um, Richard. Hi, Richard White's Hudson Institute. What developments could cause you to change your conclusions? Um, what you know, what developments were all, and then implied in that is, what do we need to do to make sure these developments don't happen? That we sustain a good uh, net benefit in the relationship for both sides. Interesting, gentlemen. I just we didn't address that in the report, and I'm going to try, as we've been doing, to stick to the substance of the report. I'm not now uh, denigrating a good question, Richard, but we didn't address that in the report. And I don't think I could just say for the next, for the foreseeable future, I think the answer is zero events that might happen, but maybe that's a failure of imagination on my part. Um, but we didn't address it in the report. Yes, sir. On the um, can you use the mic? I think I can. Thank you. <laughs> well, my name is Greg Craig. Um, I have a question, Bob. For you about um, something that I don't have to say, don't you agree? Because I think you both agree that there's a widespread perception that the U.S. does pay a cost, that the strategic relationship with Israel is a strategic liability. And the question I've got is, is that perception itself a strategic liability that does damage to our ability to operate in the world. And I think that your recommendation that we should make Israeli strategic importance to us a part of our declaratory policy recognizes that that widespread perception that we suffer from the relationship does do damage to our ability to function. 
And so that's a, that's a, it's a difficult way of looking at it. But many people remember the period of time when there was Palestinian terrorism and American citizens were part of airliners that were being hijacked. And they could identify with specificity p prices that American citizens were paying for the relationship with Israel. And that gets transported down, I think, through history so that almost every terrorist act in one way or another, whether it's an attack on a naval vessel or whether it's a blowing up of a, a barracks in, in Lebanon or whether it's a 9-11 attack, somehow gets blamed on our relationship with Israel. And it seems to me that's a real problem, that truth is important to get out there, but we've got to have a much more robust way of handling that wide per widespread perception, because I think it does damage in our ability to make peace. It, it, it damages our ability to negotiate and help the peace process. Uh, I do agree with that, Greg. I think that, um, and it's back to what uh, we were saying earlier, um, as long as uh, major parts of the government don't share uh, this view and don't internalize it and it doesn't become part of their DNA, we all who have been in government know that uh, they have many ways to, in fact, undermine the quality of the policy in the day-to-day -day sense. Um, as, I, as I mentioned earlier about India, 10 years later, there are still people, especially the non-proliferation ayatollahs, who are still seeking to undermine the very foundations of the relationship that two presidents now have, have, um, have endorsed. Um, I'm not sure exactly how you get out of it, get at it, except, as we've been saying, addressing it publicly and, and vigorously um, uh, in uh, a day-to-day -day sense. Because I think when you're trying to change attitudes, um, evidence matters. I'll just say one thing. We ventilated this report uh, with a dozen or more people, uh, some of whom agreed with it and some of whom didn't but we appreciated all of their comments, uh, but it was a wide spectrum of folks. And then subsequently I've had conversations, and I don't want to uh, overcharacterize this, but what I'm struck by when the force of the back half of the argument about do you pay a price is put, to at least some people I've talked to, and I, in a typical Black Willian way, am insistent that they answer the question, well, could you be more specific about what price the United States is paying for this, that being unable to do so, they get mad. No, they get mad. And uh, I recently had a conversation with a very distinguished journalist, who you all certainly know the name, who was reduced to saying to me, if you knew the Middle East as well as I did. <laughs> and, and we know that's this is a very distinguished person, we know that's the last refuge, right? He can't think of any examples, uh, so that's the last refuge. But I'm struck, this is a very emotional topic for a lot of people. One, I hope you'll agree that the report itself has a rather flat prose nature to it for that reason. We, we didn't want to, it to be incendiary. We try to to use prose that is understated, if anything, and based on our best uh, fact-finding. But this is going to be, and Greg is absolutely right, this is going to be a long-term slog. It's because people, for ideological reasons, or professional reasons, or institutional reasons, uh, will resist. Some resist. And again, I guess get back to the leadership our political leadership in the White House, across the government, in the Congress, and we were up in uh, the Senate this morning talking with uh, senators who were saying the same thing, that this is going to be a long slog, but it's a slog that it seems to me is absolutely crucial for us to undertake, and uh, to undertake it every day, every day, every day, because that's really the only way you change the uh, lower intestines of, of public policy is every day, every day. It's not a speech. It's not one speech, two speeches. It's every day. And Greg, if you do have suggestions on this, that would be very useful. Um, in the back right, Dan Handel.
last time uh, we worked on an issue. Last time we worked on an issue was when the uh, Israelis took out the Iraqi reactor. Uh, the Israelis have now taken out a Syrian reactor. So since uh, part of your report is prospective, and having gone in Washington through the phase at the Pentagon of strategic dialogue, then there was strategic partnership, then it was now, now you're going to strategic asset. Uh, let me try to do it this way. Uh, I have little doubt, personally, that the Arab world uh, is absolutely and totally convinced that we're in cahoots with the Israelis. We have to be. After all, I was born in Israel, and I worked for you, Walt, and I worked with you, Bob. So, I mean, obviously, we've infiltrated the entire system. Uh, my, the one I'm sort of uh, wonder about, uh, I, I vividly recall working for Bud McFarlane and always wondering whether if neither the Israelis, neither Begin nor uh, the Iraqis had ever said a word about the Israelis taking out the Assyric reactor, whether it would have been literally a tree falling in the forest. Uh, it took something like uh, 28 hours for an announcement to be made that that thing was taken out that we knew about and how to sit on it. Uh, I guess my question is, if, if there is a strategic dialogue, a, a serious one, going on between the Israelis and the Americans with respect to uh, Iran's nuclear program, um, I wouldn't rule out one of two possibilities. Uh, one possibility is that the Israelis can, well, three possibilities. Uh, we, we go on the current approach, do nothing. Uh, that's the easy one. Uh, another alternative is the American, uh, the Israelis convince the Americans that uh, this is something you guys have to do, and the U.S. puts together the, uh, you know, leading from the rear and has somebody do something. Uh, and the third option is the Israelis just do what Begin decided to do on the Iraq one. It turned out that they had talked to us uh, quite a bit about it, and we did nothing, so he decided to act. Uh, that we wake up one morning literally and find. Uh, U.S. airplanes having taken out something. I'm not sure they could get everything, but they attack Iran. Just for the purposes of making the uh, case a little harder, suppose the uh, Iranians the next day attack U.S. forces in the Gulf. What does that do for your notion of uh, Israel as a strategic asset? Gentlemen? And don't give me the answer, Walt, that it's a hypothetical. <laughs> Well, part of the problem is that it is a hypothetical. <laughs> and, like, and like most hypotheticals, it's very hard to answer conclusively unless you know the whole set of circumstances. I, my, you know, to put it mildly, that was not, you know, what would happen if the United States or Israel attacked Iran if Iran's programs got to whatever point was, to put it mildly, not the subject of our study. So I suppose I really shouldn't say anything, but I will give you my personal view. I can understand getting to the point. I, I think this question is much putting up the Israeli, Israel doing it makes it too easy. Be the question is much more, un much easier to analyze if you ask the question, does the, do you come to a point where the United States would want to do it? <clears throat> And then how do you weigh the consequences and so on? Um, my view, and you you are actually, if you're still at OSD, you're in a better position to answer this than I am. My impression is that there is no magic military solution to the problem. And as long as that's true, that's a fairly powerful, not ma strike magic, but there is no comprehensive, easy, get it over in a few days and it's over for a long time solution to the problem. As long as that is the case, the case for using military force is pretty weak. If you assume that there is an answer, then I want, want to know the, the circumstances. I think it's important, and again, it's just my, my personal view, and I, don't, I honestly don't think Bob agrees with me. Uh, because we have occasionally discussed the issue. Um, you might get to the point where you felt that it was essential to try to do something, and if you thought you could do something that was effective, you might do it. I think it is very important that we not rule out the possibility of military force, because you can't rule out getting to that situation. 
in which you would decide there was a useful military objective, a useful military option, and it was worth the consequences. Uh, I think it's important not to rule it out, but I also think you shouldn't have the illusion that, well, you know, we'll just play along for a little while and then we'll go and we'll have some uh, surgical strike which will solve the problem for us. Let me just add one thing, which is, uh, which is in the report, which is, uh, you can think of innumerable contingencies here on the Iranian nuclear program, but uh, surely uh, as uh, Iran goes on as rapidly as it can to try to acquire nuclear weapons capability, it's in the interest of the United States to have the closest possible intelligence relationship with Israel. And what I'm told by our intelligence community is that estimates regarding the Iranian nuclear program are now quite close on the part of the two governments and the two intelligence communities, which as you know, was not the case five years ago. But as we go forward, uh, that's an absolutely essential part of the American calculations as to the options available as Iran continues its nuclear weapons capability is this uh, uh, asset of Israeli intelligence as we try to think what to do about that program. And since that, in my judgment, the Iranian nuclear program is the most consequential danger to the United States today in the Middle East by several magnitudes, then having the benefit of Israeli intelligence on that subject is a major issue, a major advantage, a major benefit for American national interests. Gentlemen, I want to thank you both. I think uh, in your very understated way, and uh, I think when you read the report, you will see this is not a, um, uh, this is not trumpeting from the mountaintops, but this is an understated, um, uh, uh, understated report. In your very understated way, I think you've made a very provocative and powerful argument. And so I want to thank you very much. I thank you for joining us today. And uh, please feel free to, uh, to pick up copies of the report as you leave the Institute. Good afternoon.